Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit the subscribe button for more great true crime content. If you would like to help support Indie Drop-In, check out our Patreon at the bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from The True Crime Witch. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe to The True Crime Witch and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Good evening. You're listening to the True Crime Witch Podcast, a podcast that takes you into everything murderous, mysterious, and downright macabre. You're listening to episode 26, The Death of Baby P. This week's episode deals with child abuse, neglect, the death of a young child, so listener discretion is advised. If you have concerns that a child you know may be being abused, speak out and contact your local social services. Before we get into this week's episode, I do have a few thank yous to give. So first of all, thank you to my Latvian friend, Irvs. I didn't say this last episode, but he helped me with some of the pronunciations for the Russian names and the Russian places in my Anatoly Moskvin episode. If you haven't listened to that, go and listen to it. It's pretty insane. So these thank yous are for Apple Star, Apple Five Star Reviews even. So thank you to Paige from the USA. Thank you to Caitlin from Eat Crime, also in the USA. Thank you to Eric Carter Landon. Um, he's from True Consequences True Crime Podcast. Go and listen. He's also in the US. Thank you to That Would Go Well with Vodka from the US. Thanks to Chris, my best friend from Georgia. You are awesome. You have been nothing but a beacon of unwavering support for me. So thank you to you and your wonderful wife. Thank you to Bonnie Lee from Writing About Crime. And last but not least, thank you to Katie Katie, also from the US. If you'd like a shout out in the next episode, all you have to do is leave me a five star review on Apple Podcasts and you will get a mention. Let's get into it. So this is episode 26, The Death of Baby P. Children are the most vulnerable in our society. They depend on us for every aspect of their care whilst they develop and grow. For a long time in the UK, the issue of child abuse has been something that has not been well discussed or researched. In March 2020, the Office of National Statistics, or the ONS, released a brand new comprehensive study into the extent of child abuse in England and Wales. The study covers not just physical and sexual abuse, but dives into emotional abuse and neglect that many children face. The Crime Survey for England and Wales estimated that one in five adults from the ages of 18 to 74 has experienced at least one form of abuse before they reach the age of 16. This is around 8.5 million people. One in 100 people has experienced physical neglect before the age of 16, which is 481,000 people. Now, neglect covers not having enough or adequate access to food, shelter and clothing. Approximately 3.1 million people were victims of sexual abuse before the age of 16. Women have a higher prevalence than men in all areas except physical abuse. This could be due to underreporting of abuse by men. In the year ending March 2019, 227,500 child abuse offences were reported. Only one in five of these ended with a charge or summons, which is around 4% of all cases. Childline delivered almost 20,000 counselling sessions in the year ending March 2019, and sexual abuse comprised of the topic of 45% of those sessions. One in four women experienced child abuse before the age of 16, which is around 5.1 million, and one in six men experienced child abuse before the age of 16, which is around 3.3 million. The story of Baby P is no different to the statistics mentioned above. In his very short life, Baby P experienced horrific abuse that no child should ever be subject to. Baby P was born as Peter Connolly to Tracy Connolly on March 1st, 2006 in Harringay, North London. For legal reasons, Peter's dad has never been formally identified to British press. I will be referring to him as Peter throughout this episode, as he was known to the British media as Baby P until August 2009, when his full name was revealed in that year after court anonymity order had expired, meaning that both Peter and his killers could be named. So instead of calling him Baby P, I want to call him by his name, which is Peter. 
Tracy gave birth to Peter at the Middlesex Hospital in North London, whose children's department is run by Great Ormond Street Hospital. Now, if you're not familiar with them, Great Ormond Street Hospital is considered to be one of the top five children's hospitals in the world. It's a centre of pioneering medical techniques and offers the best care in the world to children in need. That's why many people even travel internationally to have consultations at Great Ormond Street. Since the children's department at Middlesex Hospital was run by Great Ormond Street, the level of care was beyond excellent and more than anyone could hope for when giving birth to a child or having a child who has needs and needs medical intervention. I mention this extremely high standard because at the time of Peter's birth, there were no flags, red flags raised and no warning signs to any staff that he could be in danger. Tracy Connolly already had three children, so she was experienced in giving birth, the care of a baby, and sort of how to take care and look after their development. She was also familiar with the many health visits and checkups that a baby had during its first months of life. Safe to say, this was not her first rodeo. She was just 25 years old when she gave birth to Peter, and had just been 16 years old when she had met her husband, who was 33. There is of course a large age gap, not to mention the fact that Tracy was still a child when she met her husband and the father of her four children. The pair got married in 2003 and by the time Peter was born, Tracy already had three little girls. Peter's dad was said to be elated that he finally had a son. After having three girls, he finally had another male in the family, you know, someone he could take to football matches with, like play rough with and stuff like that. He was just super over the moon to finally have a son. To the outside world, the Connolly family appeared to be complete. But not everything is always what it seems. When Peter was just three and a half months old, his biological father left and divorced Tracy soon after. He claimed that Tracy had been having multiple affairs, one of which was with Stephen Barker, who would become Tracy's new boyfriend. Four months after his biological father left, Stephen Barker moved in with Tracy and her four children, which made this time around November 2006. This date becomes important when we examine the timeline of Peter's injuries and when they start popping up and medical intervention becomes more frequent. Friends said that the new relationship seemed good for Tracy and that she was, quote, finally happy. She boasted on Facebook that it was great to finally be in love and to everyone on the outside, things seemed perfect. Tracy had a new boyfriend, the children were doing well, and it seemed like both Tracy and her ex-husband had moved on with their lives and were able to be parents in their own rights, you know, and be happy separate. When Peter was five months old, healthcare professionals became concerned about the general well-being of him and his mother. Tracy had always taken him to his appointments, he was up to date with his jabs, and seemed to be developing as, you know, a baby should. What the doctors were most concerned about, really, was actually the welfare of his mother, Tracy. She had a history de of depression, and they were most likely just concerned about postnatal depression and how she was coping as a single mother with a newborn, three other children, possibly just, you know, a welfare, are you okay, are you coping, sort of screening, is there anything we can do to help, you know, just to make sure it's good, it's a good support network, I'm glad that the doctors picked up on this. On October 12th, 2006... Peter's GP, Dr. Jerome Ikueki, noticed bruises on his head and chest. Now, Peter was around eight months old at this time of the doctor's visit, and it was unlikely that he had caused the bruises himself, you know, by stumbling around, etc. According to Tracy, Peter had fallen down the stairs, and nothing more was said about this incident. It's November 2006, and as mentioned before, Stephen Barker moved in with Tracy and her children. Now, four months seems to be very early for someone to be meeting her children, let alone moving in, but I'm not a parent, so I can't say, but I personally think it's a bit soon. It's in November 2006 that Peter presents to Dr. Ikiwiki again, with significant bruises on his forehead, chest, and right shoulder. The bruise on his forehead was over two inches wide. This time, Tracy couldn't explain the bruises, as in, she couldn't come up with a bullshit excuse as to why her nine-month-old baby was littered in bruises and marks. Concerned that this could indicate an underlying medical issue, Dr. Ikueki referred Peter to a mother and child specialist at the Whittington Hospital. 
According to a Guardian article titled, Baby P, born into a nightmare of abuse, violence and despair, he never stood a chance, written on the 16th of August 2009 by Andrew Anthony. Peter presented with a head injury, bruises to the bridge of his nose, sternum, right shoulder and his bum. As mentioned before, his GP had referred him for specialist tests and this was to rule out the possibility of any blood clotting disorders. In December 2006, Peter is seen by Dr Heather McKinnon, who immediately makes a referral to the Harringay Social Services due to the extent of his injuries. She recognises straight away that Peter doesn't appear to be suffering from any health condition that would cause these marks, and instead these marks are a clear indication of abuse and neglect. She also requests that under no circumstances should Peter be released into the care of his parent due to her suspicions of abuse. This might be the first time that you hear this, but it certainly will not be the last time you hear this in this case. Her request was ignored. On December 15, 2006, Peter is actually discharged into the care of a family friend, while social services begin their investigation into Tracy Connolly. Tracy and her mother Mary are both charged with assault against Peter, but are bailed until they have to face charges in the middle of January 2009. Throughout December and January, the police and social services investigate Tracy Connolly and the injuries suffered by Peter. During the time he was in the care of a family friend, Peter had no new bruises or injuries, he was eating well, and he was making good progress in his development. Yet, no one saw the signs at this point. No one saw how he didn't get any new bruises whilst not in the care of Tracy. No one connected the dots to being caused by factors at home just completely oblivious to the fact that this child may be being abused and this is not a medical issue what is completely dumbfounding to me is the fact that while she was under investigation for the assault of her son tracy was still allowed to have contact with him social services visited the family friend seven times in two weeks which included one random visit and everything was fine So if she's under the investigation of assaulting her own eight-month-old son, she's still allowed to see him. How does that make sense? Here is where things start to spiral downwards. On January 26, 2007, Peter is returned to the care of Tracy and Stephen, even though she's still on bail for the assault against him and he was making good progress whilst he was in care. On January 26, 2007, as mentioned before, Peter was returned to the care of Tracy and Stephen, and obviously she's still on bail for the assault on Peter, yet she's sent back to him. I'm not sure why he was returned to her care. Perhaps the family friend was unable to care for Peter for a long period of time. If so, why wasn't he placed into a temporary care situation? In February 2007, Tracy... Stephen, and baby Peter, along with his siblings, move into a bigger council house. According to the police, they had no idea that Stephen was living with Tracy during their investigation. Police were also told by Tracy that on two occasions she had seen blood coming out of Peter's ear after Stephen had bathed him. It doesn't look like this was reported to social services and no further action was taken. Testimony from a relative revealed that Tracy would spend all day on the sofa, chain smoking and talking to random men on internet chat rooms. This relative also claimed that Stephen did all of the housework and took care of her children. According to Tracy, she was on the sofa all day because she suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome and just was unable to complete daily tasks. February 22nd, 2007 is when social worker Maria Ward makes her first, but certainly not the last visit to Peter's new house. During this visit, Tracy voices her concerns, more like she moans about the fact that Peter is still on the Harringate Council's Child Protection Register for abuse and neglect. He was placed on this list just two months prior on December 22nd, 2006, following her arrest for the abuse allegations and his hospitalisation. Of course, Tracy denied all claims that she was abusing and neglecting Peter. As you will see later in this episode, it wasn't just Peter who was being neglected, but he certainly bore the brunt of it. 
On February 16, 2007, former social worker turned whistleblower Navaris Kamal wrote a letter to the Department of Health addressed to Patricia Hewitt, who was the health secretary at the time. The letter was sent from her lawyer on behalf of Kamal. And it reads the following. Dear Secretary of State, we act for the above-named claimant. She worked as a senior social worker at the Haringey Council and discovered that child abuse victims were not being protected. Haringey, of course, is the home of the Klimby tragedy. Our clients' claims follow similar res- revelations in Westminster and Leeds. Statutory child protection procedures are not being followed. Child abusers are not being tackled. Our client whistle blew the fact that the sexual abuse had been ongoing for months and the new management brought in post Klimby had not acted. She was then targeted in a witch hunt by a management who sought to dismiss her. She received a final written warning and was transferred out of child protection. What I also found whilst researching Navera's Kamal is that her letter was passed on to DCSF, which are the Department for Children, Families and Schools. DCSF responded that this is an issue that should be taken to the Commission for Social Care Inspection and thus the investigation seems to have been handed over to them. What you'll find is that instead of taking ownership of this issue, everyone just wants to pass the book to as many different agencies as possible, you know, to get themselves out of the clear. It's just so they can say, oh, well, we gave this to this this agency or this department, so therefore it's nothing to do with us. Standard. The letter from DCSF read, Our records show that we have received a letter dated February 16th, 2007, that was forwarded to us from the Department of Health, detailing an employment tribunal issued with Haringey Council, and containing an allegation that child protection procedures were not being followed in Haringey. The Permanent Secretary of the DCSF has looked at the reply, and is confident that the proper procedures were followed. The Commission for Social Care Inspection said that they had raised the concern in a formal meeting with Haringey Council and they were satisfied that everything had been handled correctly. You know, case closed, nothing's wrong, everything's fine in Haringey, nothing, no problems exist here. Navira's Kamal was not just campaigning for Baby Peter either. She brought forward at least seven other cases where children were being abused or neglected and social services had failed to act to either remove those children or to put the proper safeguards in place. The article with the full details will be listed on my website along with all other source material for this episode. For her trouble, Navarro's Kamal was given a court injunction which prevented her from talking about any of this in court and she was sacked from her position as a social worker with Haringey Council. One of the few people who actually gave a shit about Peter's case was silenced and removed from her position. Kamal herself said that it was in everyone's best interest for her to stay quiet. On March 2nd, 2007, Maria Ward is joined by health visitor Paulette Thomas. Peter had just turned one the day before. On their visit, they saw Peter headbutting the floor. Paulette Thomas commented that Peter, quote, appears to have a high pain threshold and also it is concerning he does not seem to react to danger or pain. Only his mother can stop him. He does not seem to stop himself. End quote. I don't have children, so I can't comment on development, etc. But I don't think headbutting the floor is a normal behaviour for a child of any age. The comment about his high pain tolerance seems to be a way of people explaining the numerous cuts and bruises and stuff he had all over his body. It's easy to say that something was wrong with Peter than it was to admit that abuse was happening right under their noses. Paulette and Maria decide that instead of investigating Tracy a bit more, that Peter should undergo yet more tests to determine what was wrong with him. This time he was sent to a child development centre. Now, it seems that Paula and Maria did a little bit of their job by sending Peter for medical intervention. They also spoke to Tracy about how Peter was and, you know, his and her general well-being over the past few weeks. Tracy herself admitted that she had been slacking in her childcare responsibilities after the divorce from her husband, but she told the two that she was, quote, back on the ball. 
The fact that Tracy admitted that she was slacking on looking after four children, and one of the children is showing clear signs of abuse and neglect, and no one picked this up as a concern is quite infuriating. Six days later, on March 8th, 2007, Maria Ward makes yet another visit to the Connolly home. This time, Peter is seen headbutting the sofa. It doesn't seem that any referral was made from this incident. It was sort of noted down, reported, and forgotten about. March 22nd, 2007. Maria Ward makes yet another visit. This is the third visit in March 2007 alone. This time, Peter is seen with a red mark on his chin that was explained away as him bumping into a table at a friend's house. As Peter returned one at the start of March, a one-year check was completed by Maria Ward, and surprise, surprise, when I say no concerns for his well-being were reported. Despite the numerous bruises and marks he had been seen with, despite the countless referrals to specialists who were considered the best paediatric specialists in the UK, if not the world, there were no concerns. No concerns over the fact he was always bruised or always had an injury. No concern that he would headbutt things and seem to have a high pain tolerance. There was nothing. The next account is hard to hear and from here on out the details will get worse and worse. On April 7th, 2007, Peter is seen sitting in his garden enjoying the sunshine, playing like any normal little boy should be doing on a nice sunny day. He was seen by a family friend, so it wouldn't be too weird if they, you know, stopped by for a moment, had a chat, had a chat with Tracy, said hi to Peter, but nothing about this encounter was normal at all. Peter was seen sat there in silence, being very quiet and very withdrawn, with a huge bruise on his forehead, and he was eating soil. Just two days later, on April 9th, 2007, Peter is taken to A&E at the North Middlesex Hospital by Tracy. He presents with swelling, large bruising on the left side of his head, and also had a small bruise on his right cheek, which collaborates with eyewitnesses' account of Peter just two days earlier on the 7th. Now, Tracy claims that these set of injuries are from Peter being pushed into a marble fireplace on April 5th by an older child who was around 18 months old. Again, I don't have kids, but, you know, I could see how this could be an accident while they're running about and playing. Don't have kids, so don't, don't quote me on this one. Poor Peter also had not one, but two black eyes with extensive bruising and scratches to his face and ears. He was given a CT scan to rule out any trauma or possible brain damage, but luckily nothing was found. The hospital diagnosed Peter with possible meningitis, and again... Haringey services are informed. They decide to give Tracy a fire guard so that Peter wouldn't have an accident again. It was also noted during his April 9th A&E visit that Peter had nits that clearly had not been taken care of by Tracy. Peter stayed for two nights to monitor his condition and run further tests on his meningitis. I can't find any further information about this so I can only assume that his tests came back negative and that everything was fine. On April 11th, he was discharged once again back into the care of Tracy. The hospital staff noticed that Peter seemed to be holding his head to one side and was unsteady on his feet. At this point in time, Peter was around 13 months old, so I'm not sure if toddlers are like that. Again, I don't have kids, I don't know. In the end of April, and sort of into the beginning of May, social workers continue to visit Peter and Tracy on a frequent basis, as is protocol. The report from this states that Peter was an active child, but was known to throw his body around and would even headbutt other people and objects, which is clearly not normal behaviour for a 13-month-old child, never mind a child of any age. Tracy reiterates what social worker Paul Atom has said and explains that Peter keeps having so many accidents because he's a clumsy toddler with a high pain threshold and he was just unaware of the damage he was doing to himself. During these visits, social workers note that two of Tracy's daughters are dirty and unkempt, but they regularly attend school, so apparently there's no welfare concerns there. They write in their reports that Tracy is a struggling single parent, and the neglect comes from her having to look after four children and sort of lack of parenting skills instead of bad parenting skills. 
Little did they know that Tracy was not a single parent, and if we believe the testimony of family and friends, she wasn't even the one in charge of looking after her own children. Stephen Barker was. Somehow, social services were still oblivious to the fact that Stephen lived there and did most of the work. Two more visits were made in April and May of 2007. What's important about these visits is that these were random and unannounced, meaning that Tracy had no time to prepare. We saw this in the case of Shannon Matthews, where her mother Karen would call up relatives or friends, ask them to borrow money so that she could stock up the cupboards with food, so that social services would believe that the children were being well looked after, when in fact, quite the opposite was happening. On one of these visits, Peter is again covered in marks and bruises and is admitted to the North Middlesex Hospital. Clearly these injuries were serious enough that social services decided to actually do something. Upon his admittance, 12 areas of abuse were highlighted and Tracy Connolly was re-arrested for the abuse and neglect of Peter. Peter, along with one of Tracy's daughters, was placed on the Haringey Child Protection Register and Peter and one of his other sisters were placed with a childminder for 10 days, probably to spare them the stress of being put in a care home for 10 days. For 10 days, Peter and his sister are safe. They're in a loving, nurturing environment where they are free to be children and free from abuse. But sadly, that didn't last. Clearly, her arrest didn't last, as after those 10 days, Peter and his sister are released back into her care. It wasn't until June 15, 2007 that social services finally clicked onto the fact that Stephen Barker was living in the house and was Tracy's live-in boyfriend. It took them long enough, what can I say? Marie Lockhart, who was a a Haringey social worker, was the first to make this revelation. She also uncovered more tenants. Stephen Barker's 35-year-old brother, Jason Owen, who I believe changed his name after the Baby P case to get away from the negative press and consequences, was also living in the property. But again, it wasn't just three adults living there with him. He brought along his 15-year-old girlfriend and his five children, who were between the ages of 7 and 14. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. His oldest child was just one year younger than his girlfriend. Just have a think about that for a moment. It's disgusting. Owen had a pet Rottweiler, a pet snake, and openly admitted that he was using Tracy's house as a hideout from the police. Now, Tracy had asked Owen to leave, but he refused and she was apparently too scared to do anything further. In a quote from one of Tracy's friends, she said, Tracy was unhappy with the situation and she was frightened of Owen, end quote. Now that we've met everyone involved in Peter's case, let's get a bit more background information on Tracy Connolly and Stephen Barker. Tracy Connolly was born as Tracy Cox on June 29th, 1981, to Mary O'Connor and Gary Cox. Mary was known to abuse drugs, drink heavily, and had a penchant of being particularly cruel to her children. Gary was no saving grace either. He was a violent bully with a wicked temper. Tracy and her half-brother were always dirty and left unsupervised from a young age, clearly neglected by those who should have loved and protected them. A cycle which would only continue when Tracy had children of her own. So often we see that the abused becomes the abuser. Whilst this isn't true for every single case, it's often a cycle that becomes impossible to break out of. By 1984, the volatile marriage had finally broken down, with Mary and Gary getting a divorce. Whilst for some this might have been a sigh of relief, for Tracy it was just the beginning. During the divorce, Tracy and her mother Mary moved from their Leicester home to London for a fresh start. When Tracy was just 12 years old, her mum dropped the biggest bombshell of her life. Gary Cox, the man who had raised her and she had known as being her father, turned out not to be. Mary revealed that she was conceived during a one-night stand with a family friend named Richard Johnson. Now, whilst Gary was a complete bastard, this news really shook Tracy. Tracy herself admits that the search for information about her biological father, quote, sent her wild for a bit and she went off the rails, searching for the truth whilst dealing with the trauma from her childhood. 
At school, things weren't any easier for Tracy either. A friend recalled that the other children bullied her heavily because she was overweight, smelly, and generally wasn't cared for. She would turn up to school in shoes that were falling apart at the seams because her mother refused to buy her anything. This led her to getting the name of Tracy the Tramp. The bullying wasn't just verbal, with some of the other kids taking it one step too far, and would beat her up. On a few occasions, Tracy was seen with a split lip and bruises on her face. Due to the abuse and bullying she suffered, Tracy withdrew inwards and simply learnt to, quote, shut up and put up. This was especially true in regards to her mother, Mary. Not only did she have to endure the abuse and neglect from her mother, she also had to deal with being sexually abused by a male family member. When she told her mum and asked her for help, Mary accused her of being a liar and told her to drop it, or else. From an extremely young age, Tracy began to seek attention and validation wherever she could, especially from older men, which is typical behaviour for those who have suffered abuse. Older men often took advantage of a young and vulnerable Tracy as she was so desperately seeking the love and attention she never got at home. This manifested itself in risky and promiscuous behaviour, which when you're a young teen, it's not a great situation to be in. Between 1991 and 1992, much like her son Peter would be in years to come, Tracy was placed on the Child Protection Register for abuse and neglect. The same things that her son Peter would be placed under just 14 years later. In Tracy's case, it seemed like social services took this more seriously than they ever did with Peter. When Tracy was given an ultimatum between going into a care home or a reform school, Tracy bizarrely chose the latter, being sent to Farney Close Boarding School in West Sussex, which is a school for children with special needs and behavioural issues. I'm not sure whether this next piece of information influenced Tracy's decision or whether it happened outside of her realm of knowledge, but I want to mention it anyway. According to a Guardian article titled Tracy Connolly, the story of a woman defined by abuse, written by crime correspondent Sandra Laville on August 10, 2009, a relative of Tracy's was involved in a child abuse scandal exposed by the media in the 1990s. The scandal detailed how paedophile rings had infiltrated Islington children's homes and were preying on the young and vulnerable residents. Tracy's relative, known only as Child A, was targeted and groomed by the paedophile rings operating in the homes. They even groomed and brainwashed him into helping them law in other victims. Tracy's time at boarding school seemed to do her the world of good. You know, she obtained her GCSEs, and was described by teachers as being bright and intelligent. In the eyes of social services, Tracy had made great progress during her time at boarding school. Now, it doesn't seem like Tracy was ever given any therapy during her time at boarding school. At least, it's never mentioned where I've looked, so I could be wrong. She did have therapy as an adult later on when she had quite a few meetings with Harry and Kay social services, but apart from that, I can't see anything else. Let's move on to her delightful boyfriend, Stephen Barker. Stephen Barker was born in June of 1976, only making him a few years older than Tracy, which, unlike her previous relationships that had significant age gaps, Stephen only had an IQ of 60 and was sent to a special school. Whilst Tracy also attended a special school, she was there for behavioural and emotional issues. It's clear that Tracy was the more intelligent of the two. She had qualifications in English and IT, whereas Barker claimed that he was unable to even read or write, couldn't even write his own name apparently. Barker had a strange obsession with knives, weapons and Nazi memorabilia. He was a Nazi fanatic who was into knives, weaponry, just an all-round wonderful chap. He was even known to have a crossbow in the house he shared with Tracy, because what could possibly go wrong when you have nine children in a house with access to a crossbow? Absolutely nothing could go wrong, of course not. Standing at six foot four and always seen to be wearing combat gear around the house, quite a lot of people on the estate were intimidated by Stephen Barker and kept well out of his way. Factor in the crossbow, knives, weapons, Nazi memorabilia... They had good reason to avoid him and the house. 
Not only did he have an obsession with weaponry and army gear, but he was also known to the RSPCA for abusing and mutilating animals. As a child, he was known to torture frogs. He would skin the frogs before breaking their legs and leaving them to die in pain. As I said, he sounds like a stand-up, wonderful man who you'd want around your children. If that's not enough, he was also implicated alongside his brother Jason Owen, who, remember, also lived at the house, for torturing his grandma into changing her will to suit them. Somehow, the pair escaped without charge, as sadly their grandma, Hilda Barker, passed away from pneumonia before the case was able to go to trial. Thanks to the Guardian article titled Baby P, Born into a Nightmare of Abuse, Violence and Despair, He Never Stood a Chance, written by Andrew Anthony, which I referred to before, I was actually able to find out a little bit more information about Connolly's mother, Mary. Now, the article states that Mary had a hard, hard life, which were her words, not mine. Her biological mother had died when she was just four days old, and her father had remarried when she was just five years old. She was so terrified of her alcoholic father that she would wet herself and she never seemed to really form a real relationship with him. On the subject of her father, she said he had been raised in an orphanage and we can see the cycle of abuse just perpetuates itself through multiple generations. Her father would beat her regularly and much like her daughter, she was sexually abused at a young age by a family friend. A quote from Mary reads, I was a raw young child with no sense of direction. All I knew was violence, end quote. On her marriage to Gary Cox, she said that he was a sadist. He would beat her for the smallest of things, sometimes over nothing at all. She was quoted as saying, quote, I thought it was the norm. If you're used to being battered by men, you think it's normal. In the end, I took a knife to my husband, stuck it in his stomach, just straight in, straight out. Self-defence. I couldn't prove it, but I got two years probation for that, and it was worth it. End quote. Mary herself tells Andrew Anthony that she noticed Peter had become scared of Stephen Barker just months after he had first moved in. Peter would scream and desperately try to get away from Stephen whenever he was near him. When asked, Tracy said that Peter was just scared of him because he was so tall. Philip Larkin wrote, Man hands misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. And that could not be more true for the case of Tracy Connolly and Peter Connolly. Tracy's mother was abused, Tracy was abused, and then she abused her child, a cycle that few break out of alone. Between June 2007 and August 2007, Peter's condition slowly worsened and his childminder commented that he lacked energy, something that a toddler is usually full of. His beautiful blonde locks had been shaved off in an attempt to curb the constant nits that he had. He was covered in marks, bruises and had numerous infections all over his body, mainly concentrated on his scalp, ears, fingers and toes. June 30th, 2007 is when one of the most memorable pieces of evidence comes into play in Peter's case. If you're from the UK or have followed this case, then I'm sure you'll be familiar with the photograph that accompanies the following details, as it was splashed all over tabloid newspapers for months. A social worker visited Tracy to check up on Peter and her other children. Injuries to Peter's hands and face aren't picked up, by the social worker because Tracy and Stephen had smeared him in chocolate in an attempt to disguise them. Another heartbreaking piece of information comes just five days before, on July 25th, 2007. According to Harring Hayes Legal Department, the evidence presented to them by Harring Hayes Children and Young Persons Service did not meet the required threshold for initiating care procedures. Harring Hayes Council officially turned their back on Peter and said, nothing is wrong here. Also in July 2007, the local police had concluded their investigation for the injuries that Peter had suffered between December 2006 and June 2007. Again, the result was inconclusive and they would not be pressing criminal charges against Tracy. By July 2007, Peter's fate was already sealed. Failed by so many different services and departments in his short 17 months of life, There was only one way that this was going to end. 
For Peter's dad, the late July day they spent together proved to be their last. Throughout his short life, his father had raised multiple concerns about his well-being, but as with every other concern raised, these were ignored by social services. Peter attended yet another hospital appointment at the Child Development Centre at St Anne's Hospital on August 1st, 2007, and was seen by Dr Saba Al-Zayat, who noticed bruising on his face and shoulder blades. Once again, Peter was referred for more specialist tests, as doctors were absolutely convinced that he had a medical condition, and just didn't want to believe the possibility that he was being abused. Tracy was due to take Peter for a GP appointment the next day, August 2nd, 2007, an appointment which Dr. Zaya advised Tracy to keep. Now, I'm unsure whether her booked GP appointment was related to the hospital appointment or whether it was, you know, something different, whatever. Nevertheless, Tracy did as she pleased, cancelled the appointment. Now, while this isn't odd, the thing she did after this was certainly odd. She called up social worker Maria Lockhart and told her that she didn't want to be seen or contacted for at least the next three weeks. Instead of this being a major red flag for Maria, she simply replied that, okay, that's fine and I'll be in touch at the end of August, you know, absolutely no worries. At 11.35 on August 3rd, 2007, the London Ambulance Service received a call from a frantic and distraught mother saying how her child was unresponsive and not breathing. The call came from the house where Tracy Connolly lived. One day after Tracy told Maria Lockhart that she wanted to be left alone for a few weeks, baby Peter was found dead in his blood-stained cot. Paramedics arrived at the North London home to a horrific sight. Tracy Connolly was sat on the floor holding 17-month-old Peter, who was blue and dressed in nothing but a nappy. Paramedics immediately began to revive tiny, fragile Peter. However, they were unable to. The paramedics noted that Peter was already stiff and seemed to have been deceased for some time before they had been called. Peter was rushed via ambulance to the North Middlesex Hospital, the same hospital where 17 months earlier he had been born as a bright, bouncing baby boy. At 12.20pm, Peter was pronounced dead at the North Middlesex Hospital, a devastating day for all medical staff involved. Paramedic and medical staff flocked to Tracy France as they tried to piece together what had happened to Peter before the 11.35.999 call. All she said was that he was unwell during the night, but apparently she was so scared of taking him to A&E because she would face accusations of abusing him. Tracy didn't seem all too concerned that her infant son had just passed away. Even whilst he was being transported from his house to the hospital, she made the paramedics stop and wait so she could pick up her cigs and lighter. So she showed more concern for her smoking habit than her 17-month-old son, who she had found blue and not breathing. When given the news that no parent ever wants to hear, she sobbed, Oh my god, don't take my baby boy. I have been waiting so long for a boy. Following Peter's death, it seemed that police were finally willing to take action and that within hours of his passing, Tracy Connolly was arrested. It wasn't until Peter's death that all agencies involved found out that Stephen Barker was sexually and, you know, slash romantically involved with Tracy. It also came out that Tracy was three months pregnant with Stephen's baby, which they seemed to plan on keeping. I I don't know. It's due to the nature of his death. An autopsy was ordered, and the findings were worse than anyone could have ever imagined. Before I read through the autopsy details, this is a discretion, you feel free to skip through this bit because it is horrifically graphic i understand so this is your warning peter's post-mortem photographs were too distressing and graphic to be shown in court instead digital reconstructions were entered as evidence his post-mortem revealed the following injuries to his right hand fingers loss of soft tissue in his middle finger this injury had occurred the evening before his death a fractured tibia that had happened months before his death 
Two weeks before his death, he had suffered multiple rib fractures, seven to the front third to ninth left. The coroner commented that these injuries were consistent with Peter being tightly squeezed. The most significant injury that Peter had sustained was a broken spinal cord around three or four days before his death. His spinal injury was compared to the force sustained in a car accident and was most likely caused by him being held over something like the side of his cot and hit. He had three bruises on the left side of his face with an infected area around his ear. It looked like scrapes or cuts that were not cleaned or cared for properly. Now pair this with the fact that he lived in squalid conditions surrounded by feces, which were reported as being both human and animal. He was bound to pick up an infection, and his mother never bothered to solve it. In addition to the bruises on his face, Peter was found with 10 bruises on his upper back and shoulder blades. On August 2nd, Peter had suffered a blow to his mouth with so much force that it knocked out a tooth, which he then swallowed. The coroners believed that the fall sustained from the blow could have caused his spinal injury to re-bleed, having devastating consequences on his cardiac and respiratory system. In total, Peter had 10 injuries to the head with a torn frenulum, which is the soft piece of tissue that holds things together in your mouth, you know, like the skin at the top of your gums. His left earlobe had been pulled away from the base of his ear, which essentially had ripped it away from his head. He was missing skin from his lips and tongue, along with the torn frenulum I mentioned before. Some of his fingernails had been pulled from his left hand with pliers, and the same had been done to his toes. It also appeared that his fingertips had been either cut off or mutilated in some way. The 15-year-old girl who was with Jason Owen at the time testified in court that the Rottweiler had been trained to attack Peter and drop him on the ground. She also testified that Peter had been grabbed by the throat and thrown into his cot and a bottle shoved into his mouth, causing him to turn blue. This matches with the coroner's findings of his frenulum being split and bruised into his face and neck. She also testified that the horrific spinal cord injury Peter suffered from came from Stephen Barker who was sat on the sofa treating Peter like a ragdoll when a loud crack emanated from the living room. Whatever Stephen had done to Peter had snapped his backbone in half and left Peter screaming in agony and paralysed from the waist down. She also revealed a bit more about the last moments of his life. Peter would not stop crying and screaming, mostly because he was in agonising pain, but also because he'd been left in his cot for days without food or affection. Upon his post-mortem examination, the coroner found that Peter was severely underweight and malnourished. How did social workers at Haringey Council not spot anything? He had been visited over 60 times by social workers in his short 17 months of life, yet no one seemed to spot anything. Testimony from the 15-year-old girl states that social workers simply ate up Tracy's lies and didn't seem to take a second look at Peter. During one visit, Peter was strapped into his push chair because he was too weak to sit in his high chair or anywhere else for that matter. Now, this is the same visit where Tracy had smeared chocolate all over his face to hide his injuries. The social worker had a quick look over Peter and said, hello, little fella. And then, you know, the visit visit was over. I'd like to acknowledge my source for the information about the 15-year-old girl's testimony. It comes from a Daily Mail writ- article written on November 16th, 2008, titled Teenager Reveals the Full Horror of the shocking ordeal suffered by baby Peter at the hands of his tormentors. In the final hours before his death, Peter was screaming and crying in agony and through neglect. Tracy and Stephen were visibly annoyed by this. Stephen turned around to Tracy and said, don't worry, I'll sort it. Within minutes of going into Peter's room, the crying stopped. She also claims that she was the one who found Peter dead in his cot, she being the 15-year-old girl, whilst Tracy waited two hours before phoning 999. Now, I'd like to point out that this is all testimony from the 15-year-old girl in court. It's also a Daily Mail article, so I don't know how much of this is false or exaggerated, but if this is a court testimony, I'd like to believe that it's the truth. 
In the examination by Dr. Zayat, Peter's broken back and broken ribs went unnoticed. The other horrific abuse Peter had suffered was also not picked up on by the doctor. His autopsy details how these injuries were predated to the hospital visit, so why were they missed? Especially by a paediatrician who specialises in the care of babies and children. Whilst Tracy Connolly was in police custody, Jason Owen and his 15-year-old girlfriend, who I'd like to add seems to be a victim in all of this, had to run away and were hiding out in Epham Forest. Thankfully, police were able to get hold of Stephen Barker and he was taken into custody straight away. When Tracy's house was searched following her arrest for the death of Peter, police found hardcore pornography, vodka bottles, cigarette packets, animal feces, human feces, knits, Nazi propaganda, knives and fake guns and of course the crossbow, not to mention that the house was completely filthy and looked like it would probably never been cleaned. This was the only life that 17-month-old Peter had ever known, a life of abuse, pain, filth and violence. Police managed to track down Owens and soon the three main suspects in Peter's death were in custody. During the interviews, Barker and Owen turned on each other and began pointing the finger at each other. Owen told police that Tracy and Stephen had wrapped Peter up tightly in a blanket, placed him face down on the floor and left him all day. Meanwhile, Stephen claims that Owen had taken all the bedding off Peter's cot and put it into the bin. I'm not sure how that fits into his death, but those were the allegations made against him. Due to the lack of evidence and reliable witnesses in Peter's case, we will likely never know the truth behind his final painful moments on earth and who is really responsible for his passing. Because there was a lack of evidence, Stephen Barker and Jason Owen were found guilty of causing or allowing the death of a child or a vulnerable person. They were found not guilty on charges of murder. For her involvement, Tracy pled guilty at the last minute and, like Owen and Barker, was found not guilty of murder due to insufficient evidence. On May 22, 2009, Tracy Connolly was sentenced to an indefinite sentence with a minimum of five years under the term that she can be released when she is no longer a risk to the public, small children or vulnerable adults, which I think could be never in between the sentencing for the death of Peter, Tracy and Stephen also stood trial accused of raping a two-year-old girl, a girl who, like Peter, was on the Herring Case Child Protection Register. Both Connolly and Barker were given false identities to allow for a fair trial, as the courts feared that the detail of Peter's case could sway the jury's judgment on account of guilt. For this, Stephen was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 10 years, whilst Tracy was found not guilty of charges of child cruelty against her. For the death of 17-month-old Peter, Stephen Barker was just given 12 years in prison, which runs concurrent to his minimum term of 10 years for the rape of the two-year-old girl. Concurrent sentences run alongside each other, so if I'm correct... Barker will serve a minimum of 12 years in prison before he's eligible for parole. Not that I hope, you know, I hope that the parole board have an indefinite no, but it's 12 years and then he can be at least considered, he can at least appeal. For his involvement, Jason Owen was handed an indefinite sentence with a minimum term of three years, which after severe public backlash and outcry was upgraded to six. The aftermath of the Baby P case was enormous. Just Google his name and thousands upon thousands of articles will come up, from scummy tabloid newspapers to online social media posts calling for the heads of Connolly, Barker and Owen. No one in the UK could believe that Peter was seen over 60 times by social services, yet was allowed to remain in that house of horrors. For people in the UK, it raised many questions about the effectiveness of social services and also the effectiveness of courts and our governments. Many started campaigns to get the death penalty reinstated, whilst others wanted a retrial for those involved. Dr Al Zayat was suspended by the medical counsellor, and is no longer allowed to practice medicine, and obviously is no longer registered as a doctor. 
Peter's GP was also suspended by the General Medical Council for failing to act on the marks and bruises found on Peter's body. If you're from the UK, you may be familiar with the Victoria Clemby case. Victoria was an eight-year-old girl who was tortured to death by her great-aunt and her great-aunt's boyfriend. Over the course of a year, between 1999 and 2000, Victoria was systematically tortured. She was tied up, left without food or water, and was beaten with bike chains, hammers, wires, and burnt with cigarettes. She was hospitalised on many different occasions, yet every service involved failed to spot that anything was wrong. Victoria was also under the care of Haringey Social Services, and her death sparked a huge reform into the way that social services operated and handled cases such as these. A review conducted by Lord Lamming in 2009 found that most authorities around the country had failed to adopt the new policies put in place following the reforms after Victoria's death in the year 2000. Sharon Shoesmith was removed from her position as Head of Children's Services at Haringey Council. Maria Ward and other social workers were sacked for, most, for gross misconduct for their involvement in Peter's case. You'll be pleased to know that as of January 2020, Tracy Connolly has been denied parole numerous times. Now, she was released in 2013, but was returned to prison after breaching her parole conditions, and ever since then the prison system has been fighting to keep her inside. Much like Tracy, Stephen Barker has been denied parole numerous times. He has been handed a life sentence, so I can only hope that the courts will stick to this, keep him locked up forever. Sadly, I cannot say the same for Jason Owen. According to a Daily Mirror article titled Baby P, Killer Jason Owen Working as a Light Coach Offering Fitness Advice Under a New Identity, he was released in 2014, given a brand new name and a brand new appearance to protect his identity. He is now free to live his life and forget about the brutal murder of 17-month-old Peter. The scariest part of Peter's case is that a survey conducted in 2015 by Community Practitioners and Health Visitors Association found that out of 751 health visitors and social workers, 47% of them said that history was likely to repeat itself and a similar death could occur again. So if you have any concerns over the welfare of a child, an adult, a vulnerable adult, please find your local social services, find a local service that can help. Most reports are anonymous, they won't know who it came from, and you could really be making a huge impact and saving a life. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Not enjoyed, but you understand what I mean. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening, as always. If you haven't joined the Facebook discussion group, go join it. Just search for Spooky Gang, the True Crime Witch podcast discussion group. Um, you can then just join and enter through there. As always, I'm on Twitter, just at True Crime Witch, Instagram, at True Crime Witch Podcast. I have a Patreon, where for a dollar or three dollars, you can help support the podcast and get early access and exclusive content. And remember, friends, stay safe and stay spooky. Thanks to the True Crime Witch for the amazing episode. Check out the links in the show notes to subscribe. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.